All right, all right, all right. Welcome to this episode of Warrior Week Parables from the Pit. My guest this week is graduate of Warrior Week 52, John Blackburn. Welcome to the show, man. What's up, bro? Thanks, Coach Sam. Uh, life is good. Life is good. <laughs> all the way from San Diego, man, here late night, going through the podcast. And we're going to talk about... Uh, we're going to talk about your story, John, and um, talk to me how you how you got introduced to Warrior and uh, what kind of resonated with you, man, uh, to begin with. Yeah, so I got introduced to Warrior through one of my best friends, Ryan. Uh, he Who that? Who that? Ryan Hewitt. Yeah. He is Ryan Hewitt. Ryan Hewitt. Oh, yeah. Ryan here from, from Canada? Yeah, well, he's from Canada, lives in Boston. Oh, yep. Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ryan is a great guy, man. Great human being. You guys still in touch? Every day. Fuck. Yep. You guys text, send a text to Ryan. He needs to bring his ass here on the fucking show. Yeah, he needs to fly out here. Shout out to Ryan. Bring your ass here, bro. <laughs> Get out here, buddy. <laughs> he graduated, uh, what are you week? 49? 49, yeah. 48, okay, yeah, something 48, like that. 48, yeah, okay, yep. cool. Okay, so so Ryan is uh, you know a pseudo professional athlete, one of the most crazy fucking human beings I've ever met in my entire <laughs> life, and he uh, was struggling with a lot in his life. Kind of uh, essentially spent uh, instead of drinking himself uh, and his life away, he basically worked out until he uh, pissed his life away, and basically he got to a point where he needed to to find himself again he needed to uh he wanted a better life for his marriage yeah. and uh he came to warrior week and he left warrior week and called me and said man you know i've done some crazy hard shit in my life and that hands down was the hardest thing i've ever done and this is a guy that's gone through the 48 hour uh kokoro um workout and the whole nine yards and he said emotionally and physically it was the hardest thing and i I said, okay, let's let's go ahead and let this simmer down for a little bit and see kind of how long it takes effect. And over the course of the next six, 12 months, um, it was life-changing for him and his wife and his family and his business. And I said, wow, there's there's something here. So I signed up. Nice. Warrior Week 52, was yep. it? Okay. Warrior Week 52. Um, and uh, so talk to me, man. You come in. Uh, and let's talk about the buildup first. What what kind of star- stood out for you during the buildup, as you can recall? So the first 30 days into the buildup, uh, it was probably one of the most interesting experience I've ever had. <laughs> just, just from the standpoint of uh, no one was playing nice in terms of the coaches, which uh, now looking back, I understand why that had to happen. Ultimately, you know, uh, we got thrown into this pod with, you know, 17 other guys or 16 other guys, including myself. And then we were there uh, basically just sharing all of our deepest, darkest secrets, shit that we literally never told anyone in our entire lives. And, you know, uh, the coaches were there just watching these videos and calling us out on our shit for not being truthful in certain scenarios and knowing that we can go deeper. And I was like, holy hell. You know, I find my time. I find myself like recording a video for the 30 day um, lead up, you know, in my car, just sobbing, you know, yeah. you know, just being so brutally honest with myself. And it, it was just it was really one eye opening to how much I've been hiding to not only myself, but everyone else around me at the same time, you know, just liberating to kind of finally get that off of my chest and, you know, find a, a place to to move on from. And then uh, you step into Worry Week and you step into the first night, um, you know, the, the, the whole experience of the pit. Uh, what was your experience inside of that and uh, what do you recall from that night? So the, the first thing that really blew me away was how much the coaches actually paid attention. When we got there, when all 17 of us showed up, it was like you guys knew us you know, for the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, however old one of us was. And, you know, you were right, you were right there with us, Mm -hmm. which, you know, in in all the coaching and trainings and stuff I've done in my life, you know, I've never experienced that type of attention, detail, and, you know, ultimately caring. Um, From the pit standpoint, uh, you know, that in itself was very emotional. There was, you know, it was just, I remember carrying a sandbag filled with all my guilt and my shame and my fear and all the bullshit that I had, you know, just bottled up and drug along with me like, you know, an anchor. 
and just the experience of you know putting meaning to that that sandbag and that that weight and having the opportunity to to literally shed it empty it out and just lose my mind all at the same time to clear myself of that was you know just it felt like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders i mean things with in my marriage, you know, this animosity and, and, you know, anger and hatred I had towards my father, you know, the guilt and shame I had around my mother and, and her sickness and not being there as much as I thought I wanted to be there. Just, just letting all of that go. It was, it was, you know, we just literally hit bottom, hit pit. And from there it was a rebuilding process. Uh, w- one of the pain, um, you know, one of, one of, one of the scars and the pain and then that, that, uh, was, uh, kind of heavy, uh, if not the heaviest on you was, uh, you know, the loss of your mom. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you want to talk about that a little bit? Cause that's, that's kind of like where the wound was open, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that started a lot of, you know, my spiral or, you know, my, my dive into the pit, which was at this point five and a half years ago. And, you know, my mom was my best friend, you know, she was the person in my corner every day of my life. She was with me, you know, through thick and thin and just the, the person that I related to the most. And, you know, I watched her suffer for, for 10 years and, you know, I know that one of the biggest reasons why she put herself through all that pain, torment and suffering was to, you know, be near me, be alive for me, see me get married, see me have kids. You know, that was that was her source of strength. And, you know, I took that on whenever uh, she died. You know, I look back over to those 10 years of suffering and go, fuck, you know, you know, that was on me. Right. And, you know, not in the literal sense, like I made her do that, but at the same time, you know, speaking feeling how much she loved me and how much she wanted to be around me and what I felt was a lack of attention and time and effort that I gave her was a lot of guilt and shame that that I bottled up and and wore with me. Um, So your story and your mom relation, uh, relation, the relationship you had specifically with your mom uh, stands out in all of the stories of the graduates of Warrior Week so far. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we have guys who are very close to their, to their mom, and uh, but yours always stood out. And I've always talked about it post your worry week to other graduates, uh, you know, in relevance to their relationship with their mom. Mm-hmm. And you were always, always the, the reference in my mind because I always remembered your story. Um, and particularly the fact that you shared that your mom was your best friend. Yep. And literally like, you know, the, the best friend and, and, and she's accomplished so much. Um, I, I do want to talk about your mom and I do want... I do want you to to let the world know who your mom was, mm-hmm. right? So, um, and this is something that I, I truly feel right now that it's the purpose of this conversation, mm-hmm. and that's how we're going to ride the wave, man. So, why don't you just talk to us a little bit about you know some of the accomplishment from your mom, and then and then uh, you know the specific relationship that you refer to as mm-hmm. your best friend. Um, and as well as the struggles. The reason why I want to do this is because there's a lot of men just like you mm-hmm. um, that, that feel very close to their mind, um, to, my, to their mom, right? Uh, th- there's two types. They feel very close and mm-hmm. they don't do nothing, yep. but they just feel very close. Yep. And then there are those that are feel very close and, and you know they almost like daily call their mom, right? Yep. Which is awesome. Fantastic. Uh, and so I want to hear your story in that, that kind of like cultivates that mindset. Mm-hmm. Uh, one for the one that's doing it to keep doing it. Second for the one that it's not doing it to fucking do it. And third, maybe for those that have certain distance between the mom, mm-hmm. uh, this could be an opportunity to say, "Wow, man! Like if this is possible, you know, it's never too late." Type of thing. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure out where to start here. This is probably going to be an emotional conversation for us. With with my mom, for her. You know, I look back and, uh, you know, for me, it's it's what lessons can I take away from her? And, you know, while she was here with me, what was the biggest things that she hopefully that she would hope that she taught me and that I would carry on in my life? And, and the biggest thing that always sticks out to me is is two things is one is unconditional love. Mm. You know, mm. my mother showed up in an unconditional loving manner day in and day out no matter you know what 
stupid shit I did, no matter what stupid shit other people did. Now, you know, did she punish me? And did we have those those poor interactions? Absolutely. She she wasn't um, naive to that. But at the same time, there was always an open heart. And, you know, I believe wholeheartedly that, that I got a lot of my love and caring from her from that from that lesson. And, you know, her story is she always lived for everyone else in, in her life. You know, uh, every one of my friends, you know, who are, you know, five years younger than me or five years older than me, they all learned how to swim from her. Mm. You know, she taught swimming lessons, uh, you know, every summer in our pool. Uh, she um, worked specifically with the mentally handicapped. So, you know, her ability to give and share love and bring light into any situation to to make it better and make other people feel whole was you know what her light on this earth was for sure and um you know number two uh, i up to warrior week it wasn't something that i connected with very well but after warrior week it certainly was and that was the second biggest piece to my mother was you know she the biggest thing i always hear resonate in my mind from her is johnny just do whatever makes you happy mm -hmm. and you know for the longest time i thought that that was just my mom kind of stepping away from you know maybe having a deeper conversation mm -hmm. or stepping away from really you know emotionally connecting with what was going on um and the more deeper that i look at that it's it's the simplest way to live life mm. you know w what's your calling what in life truly deeply makes you happy and that's the only damn thing you ever need to worry about right because that's gonna that's gonna fill you up and pr make sure that not only yourself but everything around you is is in a better light what a what a beautiful way to um to to be received mm -hmm. meaning you know you come home and you're like mom i'm gonna do this it's like, yeah, do 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 whatever makes you happy. And I, we had thousands <laughs> of those conversations. Oh, or, <laughs> mom, I don't want to fucking do this. It's like, Johnny, do whatever makes you happy, yep. right? And to to yeah, you're right. At at, at first, it's like, are we gonna fucking talk about this and process this? But that's the bottom line. Yep, it is. And, and it is, it is, it is. It feels so good to be in the presence of. It's such a welcoming and to be received this way mm -hmm. because indirectly as if, as if that person is giving you wing to fly. Yep, absolutely. And and that cannot take place if you truly don't practice unconditional love. Yep. Now, listen, man, I, I talk about unconditional love, but it's pretty damn fucking hard oh. to practice unconditional love, mm -hmm. meaning that you know, you can say here and you can declare that, okay, you know, I will unconditionally love my kids and my, my wife. But then there's going to be days, man, that you're going to come up with some fucking conditions. Yep. And and then there's going to be also situations where you're going to be tested, mm -hmm. which everything in the world and everybody in the world would tell you, no, no, man, don't do that. And then the gear of unconditional love comes in and you tap into that. And unconditional love means, like, no matter how much you fuck up, like, I, no matter what you do, no matter who you are, I, uncondi like, I un unconditionally love you. Yeah. Like, I put no conditions to put love into you, even if the conditions are hurtful to me. Yep. And so, um, you know, for years, Buddhas and, and masters and yogis and ninjas, well, I don't know about ninjas, but anyway. We like um, to think so. <laughs> That, like they've been pr the w like the wisdom of the the older man or whatever you want to fucking call it, man. That like the guy that that has lived unconditional love for years, right? They're trying to teach others that, um, and that's great. But there's no better way than to grow up with that. Yeah. So talk to me about your experiences with your mom, and like you know how often you would feel that unconditional love. Uh, from a, a feeling standpoint, you know, I, I don't, uh, as a young, young guy, right, you know, we're trying to be macho in the way that we live our lives yeah, yeah, yeah. and, you know, not show emotion and, you know, just be that, be that brute, right? So uh, it was hard to say that I connected with that unconditional love, you know, on a consistent basis when I felt it. 
um, you know, it more came down to reflecting on mm. all the moments that we shared together in the past, especially after she had passed away. And ultimately, you know, I, I can't remember a time in our interaction where there wasn't love present. I mean, I could do some stupid shit and mm. she would be pissed off at me, right? Mm. But at the end of the day, I always knew there was nothing that I could do that would take her love and support away from whatever I wanted to chase, whatever I wanted to do, or whoever I was as a person. And, you know, uh, the, just the, I think the unconditional love moments that were probably biggest. I mean, when you're healthy and life's going great and the world is, you know, peachy keen, I think you can experience unconditional love and give unconditional love pretty easily. Yes. You know, when you see, um, you know, someone like your mother, like I did, going through all the pain and the anguish of, you know, treatment uh, for cancer and all of the, um, you know, issues and, and, and physical ailments that came after the treatment that she struggled with for 10 years, you know, she had every single right to be angry, to be upset, to be mad at the world and just say, you know, why, why God did you deal me this hand from hell? And, you know, she never was, you know, mm. I, I'm sure in her mind at times, you know, she would question herself of why that was happening to her, which I think anyone would. And at the same time, you know, whenever I was around her, you know, it was like nothing was wrong. Mm. Right. And I knew how much pain she was in. I knew, you know, uh, towards the end uh, of her life, you know, she wasn't able to walk any longer. And I knew how much, you know, that took away from her in terms of her self-confidence and her pride and, you know, how hard it was for her to kind of, you know, swallow the fact that, you know, she's never going to walk again. Mm. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine do that. But man, she was never angry at me because of of those things. She never, exp you know, displayed her disgust or her dis-ease with uh, all of those issues. And she was just, she was always, whenever I showed up, just, just light. Mm -hmm. No matter how much pain or frustration she was in, she was just fucking happy to be with me and see me. And she always had that same loving demeanor. And, you know, w when you think about going through all those physical ailments and how you or I would show up through that process, you know, I can't imagine showing up with that much love and light, but she did it every single time I was around her. I can't, you know, over 10 years, can't even remember one slight, you know, show of anger or disgusting disgustment or anything like that you know from from all that she was going through and those moments that i shared with her over those 10 years that was really to me like oh wow that's you know that's real unconditional love that's you know no matter what's going on with me you know i'm here to hold space for you and i to share time love and energy and wow. that, that was crazy wow um so your mom um 10 years before she passed Passed away, she got diagnosed. Is that when the news came in? Yeah, so I was a uh, senior in college when she was diagnosed, and almost to the day, ten years later, she passed. Okay, and uh, how 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 did that look like? When did she break the news to you? Like, talk to me about that when you guys found out. What was it? What was the issue? And uh, you know, what what, what what does she had to do the first year, and so on and so on. Yeah, so um, she was di diagnosed with rectal cancer, and the way that I found out was uh, my mom and dad came home from the hospital um, after she had uh, some tests and procedures done, and, and they gave her the, the results on the spot. Um, they didn't share with me probably for a week or two of what, what was going on. Um, but I could tell that they were physically upset and emotionally upset. So, you know, they're... I said, hey, I'm going to go upstairs and go to bed. And, and they were sitting in the, the kitchen talking, and I'm sitting at the top of the steps, like, listening in. So that's how I found out. And yeah. I never really got the true story until, like, a, a couple weeks later. But, um, you know, it was the first, you know, six months was, like, super easy, actually. You know, she was going for uh, – every doctor said it was going to be super easy to solve and, and fix and, and get rid of and, you know, literally – Six months later, she was cancer-free, um, and she actually didn't have cancer um, for the rest of those 10 years that she lived. However, during the treatment of those six months uh, when she was getting uh, radiation done, uh, the doctor had actually uh, over-treated her, over-radiated her, and caused irreparable 
and irreversible damage to her. So essentially, um, she got to the point, just think about uh, none, everything from below your stomach never working again. And that's basically. Oh, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the digestive issues Absolutely. and not getting enough nutrients. Yep. So like all kind of problems, right? Absolutely. Yep. And like, and every day, like kind of like in hospital for one different issue. Yeah. You know, uh, the more you're exposed to something, the more numb you come to it, you, you, you get to it. And, you know, I've had this conversation with uh, Christy, my wife, a lot is, you know, there were times where my dad would call me and say, hey, your mom's in the hospital. And, you know, it wouldn't affect me because she was, had been in the hospital so much that it was just like you and me, you know, going to get coffee in the morning. Yeah. And I'd be like, you know, should I go and, and see her? And he's like, no, nah, she'll be out in a couple of days, most likely. So, you know, definitely in and out of the hospital, you know, a bazillion times. And, you know, it was interesting to see how we emotionally kind of cut off and, and, you know, distance ourselves from that after it happened so much. Wow. So, uh, obviously, you know, tremendous amount of um, joy from your mom. Mm -hmm. What was her uh, first name? Uh, Pam. Pam. So, tremendous amount of joy from Pam. Uh, like, that's that's how I hear it, right? Like, she, she, she literally fucking delivered joy inside of your heart despite her horrible situation, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, it's not even the cancer, but it's the complexity of the treatment and the complexity of, of an ecosystem that is now yeah. dysfunctional, right? And you're like, fuck, because I got to eat, I got to drink, and if yeah. I don't, <laughs> I can't even survive. Um, so anyway, despite that, she cultivated joy inside of your heart for for uh, for 10 years, and what what would you what would you say the, the the this biggest gift that your mom I think the biggest gift that your mom left in your heart not I think I know because this is what you said is this and I've seen it inside of you practicing it multiple times is unconditional love mm -hmm. right and so how how do you benefit I would say from the joy that she left in your heart oh, in in a thousand different mm -hmm. ways um, the biggest the biggest benefit or the biggest I think I guess thing I've learned through kind of unpacking all of these lessons that my mom has shared with me is really affected how I show up in my marriage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, friendships are friendships and, you know, uh, you know, you can show up and, you know, but you don't have to live with that person every day. Right. Yeah. So for me, it would, it had the biggest effect on, on my marriage, you know, when things are good or when things are not so good at the end of the day, you know, I always go back to the question my mom asked me, right? And the question is, is, John, do whatever makes you happy. And when there's a problem in my marriage, I, I take a step back and I said, you know, uh, am I happy in my marriage? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to date that answer has always been yes. Uh, you know, can there be improvements for sure? But, you know, I, my, I find true happiness in being in my marriage. I want my marriage. I want that to go on for as long as my days, right? So if if the answer to that is yes, then there's no reason why I shouldn't show up um, and share my unconditional love with Christy in order to hold space for her or for I, you know, when we're going through those those times. And at the end of the day, you know, whatever argument, whatever issue comes up today, is that really going to matter in five years, right? Is you being right today really going to matter in five years? No. So show up with love and with unconditional love and light. And, you know, that's going to lead you or led, has always led me in, in the direction that I've wanted. You know, uh, you know, in today's in today's marriages, uh, there are. There are so many scenarios that uh, as if it's required for it to be finished with a, you know, wrong or right. Yep. And in that scenario, which I call the fuck fuck scenario, <laughs> the fuck fuck scenario is when you say, no, it's right. When I say, no, it's wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. And then somebody else says, no, 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 he's right. And then somebody else says, no, 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 he's wrong. And then it's wrong, right, wrong, right, and it's the fuck, fuck. Like, everybody's in a fuck, fuck scenario. Yep. And, like, literally nobody is going to come up to a resolution. And the point is time is wasted. Time is spent rather than being invested inside of those relationships. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's a week or a year that goes by, to your point, 
none of that back and forth to say this right or this wrong mm-hmm. will actually build the future. Absolutely. There is a saying that say, uh, I think it's the truth in this is that. Uh, and so what, what that means is, uh, sorry, it's, it's this in truth is that. Meaning that whatever the truth is right now, it's what it is. And the point is, it's not wrong and it's not right. Uh, one of the practices that enables that is this unconditional love you talk about because yep. it, it it abstracts away the judgment that we all have. And like literally as alphas, as alphas, as men in society, where we're trying to build an image. You, you look at 2019, bro, like you're going to have to have some kind of fucking profile in the social. Yep. You know what I mean? And like I'm not talking about social media, but socially you're going to have to have a, a fucking profile. You're going to have to say, here's what I do, here's what I'm doing, or else like you be considered like a fucking nobody in yep. your world, yep. right? And in that place, like you're even like more alone than you would have been. Most men are alone because they're operating alone. But then add being socially alone into that, and in that space, you're like absolutely nobody. Yep. So ultimately, the unconditional love practice puts a man inside a situation where there is no wrong or right. And right. that person person operates by what makes me happy. So what I'm hearing is what your mom cultivated inside of you uh, all these years is for Johnny to pursue happiness. Yep. Like literally, Johnny, go after what you want. Go after what makes you happy. But at the same time, know that it's not something you're going to arrive at because if you're happy, then what? So it's always going to be a pursuit of happiness. Yeah. And so you bring that into your marriage, right? Like any other marriages, there are problems left and right. And and there's conversation that takes place. Your marriage is young, but you guys have been together for almost decade and plus. And inside of that, uh, you're 34. How, how old is Christy? 37. 37. So like you guys, same age, same very young marriage, uh, but then with a the history, right? Yep. Um, and obviously, like any other marriages, there's like there's problems left and right. And yep. so the way to operate is do I number one, do I want my marriage? Mm-hmm. Yes or no? Do I want to build the next 40 years with this person? Yes or no? And that's the hardest question to be honest with yourself about. Yeah. Right? Because <laughs> the there's, basic. there's so much shame and guilt that can come along with answering that question no. Yeah. Right? That you know, you're like, well, I can just suffer through this for another three years and right. figure out if you know, it's you know, the the times will be different. I won't feel as much shame and, and guilt then that then I'll leave. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that's the hardest question to to answer for sure. That's right. But when you do arrive at a yes or a no, if you say yes, this is the person I want to build the next forty years of, then then what matters is really the next forty years. Yep. That's it. I, literally that's what it matters because you said yes. Yep. So but if you say yes and then you start like bringing all this fucking past into it, bro. Like you're not, re- you really don't want the next forty years. Yeah, there's there's not a yes with condition. There's not. A, that's the point. That's yeah. the whole point of unconditional love. Yeah. Right. So whatever, wh- like what is right now, it is, and so. But if you try to label as what was was wrong. Yep. Some of the was was okay, or some of the was was great, but it no longer is. Yep. Because that's that's how guilt and shame is built, right? It's like, hey man, it used to be so. This marriage used to be so fucking awesome, but it no longer is. Why the f- what's the fucking point to talk about it anyway? Yep. If it no longer is, why label it as great in the past? Yep. Like, let's just look at it what it is right now. Do you want to be happy? Yes. Do you want to be in a pursuit of happiness? Yes. Do you want to pursue happiness with this person in the fucking bus with you in the next 40 years? Yes or no? Yes. It's a simple three yeses yep. to figure out what are, like, eliminate any condition that says no. I will build the future for you with you only if you comply to these regulations. Yeah, one of the most powerful things I, I've ever read about marriages is this thought of, you know, being in a marriage or getting ready to marry someone. And in your mind, there's a placeholder that says, you know, I will be perfectly happy with this other person if something changes. <laughs> right. It's like, well, do you know, you married this person for a reason. You married them for who they are, not for who they're going to become. Be very well right? said. So, you know, you you know, if, say that again, bro. You know, you, like say, say you, it, like bring your lips close to the fucking yeah. mind. Say it in a way that's gonna fucking like 
be broadcasted through the, the actual one person that fucking yeah. needs to hear this. Yeah, you married this person for who they are, not for who they are going to become in the future. So remember that when making that decision, one, to be married, or making that decision, you know, do you want to pursue this marriage, yes or no, right? It's, dude, that's like... You married the person from for who they are, which means, bro, you already know who the fuck this person was. Yeah. And if you didn't because you're a fucking idiot, then you should have probably met. That, that's not a marriage then. Yep. Then that's just a fucking mistake if you didn't know the person. Yep. Let's just put it that way. Absolutely. Right? If you got married and it's been three months and like, oh, well, that's just a fucking mistake because you didn't know who the fuck you're marrying. Most men and most women that marry each other know exactly who they're marrying. Now, some people get married at 19. I would say they have no fucking idea who's they're marrying because yeah. 19, you're in the process of becoming. Yep. Like, listen, bro, 19, you, you <laughs> you're you going to become you're, five different people in the next couple at years. At 19, you're a little fucking pussy. You haven't yeah. fucking lived life enough to understand what life is and what your character is. You're just discovering it. Yep. You are just like your opinion at 19. Yeah, it's very heated, very heated, <laughs> very heated opinion. Right. Yep. But your experience doesn't back it up. And you, you could have a really bad childhood and war, but you haven't you haven't lived the next decade to figure out what is the counterbalance of that you know bad childhood. Yep. So you get nineteen year old that think they're fucking on the world and they're gangster and they they figure it out because they lived through shit from nine to nineteen, a decade of struggle. Yeah. Right. I get it. I'm not dismissing that. But bro, you haven't lived the next ten years to counterbalance that. You've seen the yen, but you haven't seen the yin. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, so, 19, you don't know the person when you get married. Nope. Like, let's just fucking be honest. Let's cut the shortcut. Let's, like, start, like, we're not a, like, it's straightforward fucking facts. But it's going to be a certain age when you're going to be spending some time with a person. Let's say, you know, I don't know, from 19 to 24, 23, now four or five years. In the course of those three, four, five years, you get to know a person. Mm -hmm. You get to know how they are with you. You also get to know how they are socially with you in your presence. Yep. And a lot of time when the things they do in socially with your presence, which, which may not, which may be disliked for you, kind of triggers you. And there's conversation that takes place and you work through it. And if you don't, you get separated. And if you don't, it's great. Yep. So whoever you married, man, you already know this person. You already know everything about this person. Yeah, we were together for eight years before we, yeah. we got married. So, so we, patterns, we behavior, yeah. like like you already know the person. You already know the way they operate. Yep. And then what happens is that you start chasing this you should be. Yep. Which by itself is it's a fucking judgment, bro. Yeah, 100% a judgment. 100%. So you're chasing a judgment on the person that you claim to love the most in the world. Yeah, and you're chasing a condition like, you know... <laughs> I, I conditionally married you based on the fact that I had a desire and hope that you would wind up being this person in the future, right? <laughs> that, isn't that fucking crazy? Yeah. Like, and that's the mirror that we all have to face, men and women. Yeah. It's like, I married you for the person you are, but if I'm chasing another person in you, bro, like, <laughs> yeah. come real with yourself. You're not going to ever find that person. You have to chase that person. Yep. I have to chase and hunt a better version of me. Yeah, and just realize whatever condition you're putting on that that spouse, that wife, that that husband, that's that's your mirror. That's yes. where you lack, right? That's that's where, you know, you're unhappy in yourself that you're hoping this other person will now be able to shine a light in that dark place in your heart. 100%. Yep. And when you go through a conversation like that, there's self-reflect that can take place. Mm -hmm. And it, it all comes down to expectation. Mm -hmm. Like sitting here right now, I'm like, okay, well, bro, you know, I've, I've been kind of that guy that kind of like had a list of expectation for my wife. And the, and the point is, well, am I putting fucking conditions? Or am I... I'm like, okay, I guess I am putting some fucking condition. Okay, well, let me back back the fuck away because that's not the person I'm married. Yep. I already married that person. I already know she cooked yep. or she didn't cook. I already know she would wash the dishes or she wouldn't wash the dishes. Yep. Like, dude, listen, if she already if she cooked 10 years ago, she's probably cooking right now. Yep. And she's good at it. If she never cooked 10 years ago, she ain't going to fucking cook. Don't expect to come home and have the fucking meals ready. Yep. It's going to be some Pizza Hut ordered and some shit 
the, you know, some margarine on top of the fucking Pizza Hut, and it's going to be cold because you, your ass comes home at two hours late. Yep. And, and guess what? You're going to have a fucking Diet Pepsi on the table, and there's not going to be no fucking ice. Yep. You're going to get your ass up and get yourself a glass and put some fucking ice in it and have ice, Diet Coke, and a pizza delivered two yep. hours and a half later. I mean, or you can have like a really fucking nice meal that is prepared, and it just depends who you marry. Absolutely. I mean, you know, for me, <laughs> my wife is a fantastic chef when she does cook, but she's not a, you know, come home and, and cook dinner type of person. Yeah. Right. I know that. I know that I'm going to be the one to make sure there's food on the table or she's probably just not going to eat. Right? right. Right. So, you know, and that's w would I love to come home and there be a hot meal on the table every night? Absolutely. Right. But do I come home frustrated and angry that you know, that isn't done? No, because I know that's not who I married. And that's OK. That's I'm right. Totally happy with that. Talking about this, I realized that fuck, she's she is putting a condition on me. So my wife, my wife cooks and she cooks really good and she cooks Persian food. And so when I come home, I eat that. Yep. And then uh, I think a year ago, she said like, I'm gonna stop fucking cooking because you know you eat all this food and you're becoming too big. So <laughs> I'm gonna help you. I'm like, hey, bro. <laughs> but were you this big when she married you? I, I think I was, man. Oh, okay. And I, right. I, I, I don't know. I, I think I was, man. You know, I'm like, bro, what happened to the meal? <laughs> <laughs> I think my daughter, she's two, and it, it just kind of gets, uh, uh, you know, she's so busy with her, and it takes so much of her bandwidth and energy. And, but dude, I just took her for a weekend, and it, it is absolutely, I don't know how women do it, Ben. Like, I'll, shout out to all the women that are able to handle kids more than two days, and shout out to all the men that are able to handle the kids more than two days, because fucking 24 hours is like, please come help and get... Uh, yeah, that's not my forte. So I'll I'll be very honest on this podcast. If you ever want someone that will talk about a long period of time of taking care of y very young children, I am not your guy. I won't be your podcast. <laughs> um, however, a uh, ten year old, yeah, I can handle that. I can hang out for a while with a ten year old it's because they can reason. A uh, two year old yeah. can't reason. Yeah, and then two year old, no, two year old is always right. Yeah, it's like fuck, man. No matter what you do, they have the frame. You're like, bro, yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, the, the ten year old, I believe it's uh, it's where I want to put all my energy. I have this, I have this thing that I I want the ten year old to be like everything that a twenty year old would be told to be told to a ten year old. Right. Why not? Yeah, I mean, just getting that. Why insight. not, bro? If I can bring ten years in advance to you, I'll do it. Now, here's the I think the. Maybe the crux of that is, will they listen at ten? Yeah, probably not. Three three words into it, some of the, uh, one of the guys shared on this podcast. Three word into it, they're no longer listening. Yeah. So if you have to deliver a message, make sure it's within the three words, or else like they're already yeah. like. Because I can only imagine how many times <laughs> I've fallen flat on my face in my life and look back and go, "Holy shit, my dad told me about this a decade ago." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, man. So let's come back to Worry Week. You go through that experience. Obviously, Worry Week 52, a one of a kind fucking Worry Week. All the guys still together, still united a year after. Um, it's amazing. And so it's been it's been a year, man. What what did that experience do for you in life? Oh man, that was uh, it was a game changer. Um, I think uh, you know to sum it up, and then we'll kind of expound yeah. on it. But a, a few of the the biggest pieces is one letting go a lot of the guilt and shame that I had in my marriage, you know, about my father, about my mom, like just just dropping all of that bullshit and just walking away a thousand pounds later. And, you know, it, it not only allowed me to shed this weight, but it also allowed me to find my own power. Like, holy shit, I'm a, a pretty good human being. And, you know, I shouldn't, you know, uh, there were some, you know, situations in my life that were not okay, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I felt like I needed to, to hide from them because of, something that, you know, I would do wrong or some shame that I would take from that when really, you know, it was my place to step up and say, hey, this isn't fucking cool. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to walk away from that or, you know, I'm going to change the way that, you know, this shows up in my life. So, you know, shedding that weight, finding my own power and just getting really clear right on the direction that, you know, I needed to go. Now, leaving Warrior Week, it wasn't like, you know, the whole world shifted in a, in a second and, you know, I could chase after every single thing that I was clear about, you know, definitely certain things had to be put in place in order for that to happen. Um, but I, I would have never found, um, found that direction to, to point my ship if, if it wasn't for Warrior Week. And just one final note, 
um, the biggest shift that I had was, you know, I, when my wife and I got married, you know, we'd been getting, we'd been together for, you know, 12 years now, you know, probably 11 years at that point in time. And, you know, regardless, married, not married, it was like, you know, Christy's my wife, I'm her husband, you know, we're married, right? There, there doesn't really need to be much more said about it. When in actuality, I found that I didn't make a conscious and unconscious decision that I really wanted to be married to my wife. Mm. And I made, uh, you know, through Warrior Week, this light bulb, this switch was, you know, hit where it's like, holy shit, I want to be married to this woman. Like, you know, if, if this marriage is the best thing in my entire life, everything else, business, my body, my whole world is going to be better, right? And I left Warrior Week with the, the number one goal in my life was to make my marriage as positive, as unconditionally loving, as fucking great as I could humanly possibly make it. That was that was the biggest thing. You know, one of the most important uh, character that a uh, man can have is the ability to believe. Yeah. And uh, not blindly believing in some, you know, hope that will arrive, but actually move towards with hope. Yeah, absolutely. Right? M generate movement. That means emotional movement, physical movement, psychological movement, um, but ultimately movement so any motion that brings emotion, any movement that allows your feeling to circulate as a man, because mm -hmm. that's ultimately what the problem is. Most men are fucking constipated, a.k.a. they cannot have this flow of energy mm -hmm. going through, you know, through the body with this with a a variety of feelings. Yep. They typically go to anger, blame, shame and guilt. And typically that's the cycle yep. that they live yep. in and joy and happiness from from time to time. And then they come back. To anger, blame, guilt, and shame, joy and happiness, anger, blame, guilt, and shame, joy and happiness, anger, blame, guilt, and shame, joy and happiness. Like, this is the circle. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a shit show, right? And many refer to it as chaos. And ultimately, allowing, allowing your emotions to exist, it's the movement by itself. Yep. Like, it's a feeling, right? Now, instead of having a list of four feelings, you have a list of fucking 30 feelings. Yep. And you find yourself in those feelings, and you figure out what those fucking feelings are. You already have them. You just have to seek them. Yep. Now, that movement takes place, and inside of that, you can hope and believe in the relationships that you have. One of them is your marriage. Yep. One of them is relationship with your kids, specifically younger one do when they get they become teenager because as big they become teenager, they have their own dynamics taking place. Yep. And now you have to roll with that as well. The 19-year-old I was talking about, like, bro, you're going to have to roll with that guy. Oh, yeah. And if it's a girl, you're going to have to roll with that. Right, and it's not gonna be your rolling. It's gonna be a, a a blend of two fields, one from a nineteen and one from you know much older, a guy yeah. that uh, that has been nineteen. But so the point of this is this: is when you blend movement of emotions and when you blend hope, this becomes this concept of believing. Mm -hmm. So believing is not just sitting somewhere and hoping that it comes to you. Believing is that I'm going towards it. Absolutely, I'm going towards it passionately. Yeah. Right. And so that's the switch that took place at Worry Week. Huge. Because huge switch. Worry Week, there was simply two fucking paths for you. I specifically remember because I conducted the whole fucking thing. Yep. It was either left, you either leave this woman or this marriage is over and you go and she goes and everybody finds happiness, or that you go all fucking in yep. and you go to war for this woman. Yep. And the question was, have you truly ever gone to war for this woman? Yeah, and the answer was unequivocally no. No. And then this is like, okay, this year has been my path to go after what I want. Yep. And ultimately, when you look back after a year, whatever this marriage is today, what is known for sure is that you've gone to war. A hundred percent. Like I, you know, uh, we always say, hey, leave it all out in the field. Yeah. Right. You know, if, if catastrophe were to happen today, I can look back on this last year and the time that Christy and I spent together and just know that there's not, I don't believe a single thing that, you know, I, you know, could have done differently. And I can say that I left it all in the field. My heart has been, you know, put out there on the table. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it feels fucking fantastic yeah. to not hold anything. Isn't back. It, it? Do Can you not feel the fucking power? Oh. It, when you have nothing to hide, yeah. 
there is like literally you feel like the most powerful man. You're not scared of what may come. Absolutely. Like hesitation goes away because you're not hiding from anything. No. No. Nope. It's that it's that again, it's that that whole thing of is it's what it is. Because yep. you can't you can't label the future as being wrong or right. Yep. Yeah, for me, you know, and it just it, it shows in so many different ways and and you know for men who are uh, or women who are listening to this you know just uh just a correction though i don't think there's any woman listening to this fair bro. enough fair enough well, but they may they may they may uh, you know i don't know i know but, my wife's uh, gonna listen to this right? oh, okay that's cool oh yeah no that yes yeah that many of the wives listen to this yeah uh, and then because of that, you're right. Maybe I'm, 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 maybe actually I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Because of that, maybe the wives are actually like, listen, 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 bro. Like this conversation is pretty fucking straightforward. Why don't you guys listen to this and have your fucking husbands listen to yep. this? That could be a possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey man, if it if it goes ultimately and it changes someone's life, it doesn't matter if it's a woman or woman. Or nope, yeah, doesn't it. matter. You know, for me, it was uh, every little. You know, I I I'm a I'm an analytical guy, right? So for me, you know, I looked at my marriage and just broke it into all of these different pieces and parts. And I said, how can I go to war with each one of these pieces and parts to not only, you know, gain power in myself, but, you know, share my unconditional love and just show Christy how much I love her. And, you know, it, you know, I broke it down to like the stupidest little things. Like when I get a phone call, right? So ask yourself when you get a phone call from your wife and you see that phone ringing and it says your wife on there, you know, what's that reaction? Is that reaction like, oh, fuck, what she want now? Mm. Or, or is there excitement there? And when you pick up that phone, is it, hey, what's up? Or is it, hey, sweetheart, how the hell's your day, right? Or, you know, hey, beautiful, how are you doing, right? Just looking at each one of those interactions that you're having every day with your significant other and how can you fill that with as much love as humanly possible. Right? That is beautifully said because most of our condition to answer the interaction in ways that we trained ourselves to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? So we may have this deep amount of love for our wives, yep. but when they call, they're like, hey, what's up? Yep. Versus, hey, sweetheart, how's your, how's your day? How's yep. it going? Right? Huge difference. And that choice is made at the point of interaction. Absolutely. Yep. And, and for years, we have been conditioned to submit ourselves to ways of being trained in order to say, well, hey, I'm busy during the work, don't call me. But that's a fucking story, man. Yep. But here's one thing that's very interesting is now, because we, you and I or myself, have chosen to, to go to war, chosen to watch these interactions, chosen to make a change, you know, don't start with conditions. Because now you're, you know, if you call and, you know, she just picks up and says, hey, what's up? <laughs> right? You can't be, you know, in your mind, you're like, oh, well, fuck. She doesn't answer the phone lovely like I do, right? Like, that's that's on you, bro, right? She yeah. is who she is or he is who he is, right? That's who you married, right? You're making your choice for yourself. It is not on them to reciprocate that. Beautiful. Right? One-way deposit, bro. Yep. It's a one-way deposit. 100%. No condition. Beautifully said. So, uh, hey, if you would sum it up, right, mm -hmm. for someone that is in a marriage right now and there are – they're having struggles because of different point of view, because of different beliefs, mm -hmm. uh, because of many, many, many condition mm -hmm. that they put on themselves and they allow the other to put on them. Yep. Um, and if you would like, if you would choose your word carefully in a way to hit someone in a heart like this, this bullet that would just warm their heart and affect them and 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 like move them to make a fucking change whether that's a conversation or whether that's just answering the phone differently next time mm -hmm. uh, what would those words be man for a man or a woman and uh, it's going to be cliche um, but every time you're walking into an interaction uh, especially with your spouse uh, and ask yourself what would make me happy? Hmm. Right? Do you want to show, to me, what would make me happy is showing all the love that I have in every interaction I can with Christy. Wow. Beautiful advice. Yeah. Simple, right? Because we can all fucking try to do this on the next phone call that comes in or in the next interaction. Listen, it's the next interaction. 
It just happens that we're using our phone for many of those interactions. Yeah. So perhaps every time you pick your fucking phone, whether you want to text, message, or leave a voicemail, think about what would make you happy yeah. in that interaction. Yeah. And I guarantee I can see myself being less of a fucking jerk or an asshole just because of this, this advice. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure those of you that are listening and that are resonating with you because at one point... Uh, you kind of like seeing yourself as the guy that picks up the phone and says, what's up? Yeah, and just right? so you know, you can't be happy with negative energy. Right. Right? So you can't say, what's going to make me happy, and then answer the phone like a dick or like without love. you got to answer the phone or show up at home or, you know, go to bed. And if you're asking your qu that question through these interactions, well, the only thing that's going to make me happy is love and happy energy. Right. Right, so, so then, then you can't, right? Then you won't yeah. be able to pick it unhappy. It's yeah. because you chose to be unhappy, yeah. right? And you fucked up the question. And if you're finding yourself choosing to be unhappy, that probably means there's more to it that you need to come to Warrior Week and figure the fuck out. <laughs> probably you need to figure <laughs> some shit out. And if, if that's something that you need to figure out, yeah, man, uh, you go to becomeaking.com. That's where the first interaction with Warrior is nowadays. Um, it's this, this, the stories of the seven pitfalls to learn about the seven pitfalls and then to learn three paths about warrior. There's the warrior's way, which is a self courses and educational path. And then there is the king's journey, which is the, the courses on top of the challenges and as well as the weekly interaction inside of a group called the council of Kings leading to a big fucking event of council of Kings. And that's like a year of ongoing work and in proximity remotely with uh, a group of the, uh, the brotherhood and also uh, there is Empire, a group that meets up every quarterly. Um, and somehow, somewhere, there's Warrior Week inside of all those that prepares men to come and be part of any of those experiences. So I want to thank John for being here. Um, uh, amazing, amazing conversation and uh, a topic that I wanted to talk about and go more in depth, uh, which is this whole concept of uh, unconditional love. I think a lot of men are just, you know, disconnected from it. I mean, we all have it. We've all been loved by a mother uh, at some points you know we've all been we've all felt love right it's it's finding the opportunity and the ability to allow ourselves to feel it and show it to the people that are around us you're absolutely right i i, I think we don't talk about it enough yeah and when we do talk about it we leave it at unconditional love it's kind of churchy word yeah and, and we don't get into the actual tacticalities and really the, the tactical Tactical way of showing unconditional love is to ask yourself, what will make you happy before entering into any interaction with your spouse or your loved 100%. one? And right there, because of your, your positive energy and happy energy, as you practice that, that is like you eliminate all fucking conditions because the condition exists in the negative land. Yeah. I mean, I've shown up in collisions with, with Chrissy and, and knew that going into this, this was going to be a rough hard you know you know maybe not desirable conversation that i wanted to have but you know you can show up in that conversation of hey you know we need to sit down and talk you know you fucked up right or you know you can choose hey you know we can still make this conversation positive and happy and show up hey babe you know i really love you and you know because of that I, and i you know how much i want our marriage to grow and expand i just really want to sit down and share something with you right like you know Different, How, different approach. Absolutely. And you're kind of framing yourself to get into that conversation, 100%. not to be angry, not to start blaming. So you remove the anger and blame, which you save yourself the guilt and shame later on. 100%. Right? And, and, and I'm not saying in that, those conversations, you're not going to be hurt. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's still you, you, won't be, yeah, you won't be able to avoid pain. Uh, but on the other side of pain, you'll find power. And, yep. and your power is not going to be dimmed out by the, because you got angry, because you blamed, and now you, you don't have any guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. Like pain and guilt and shame of two different lands. Yep. You go through pain, but guilt and shame is just different. It's not pain, man. Yeah, that's guilt shit and shame that is just, just down fuck forever. that, man. Yeah. Fuck that. That's the final word here. Fuck guilt and shame, what we call shilt here inside a warrior. <laughs> um, if you want to find out more about this podcast, you'll find it at warriorweeknow.com. We'll have audio, videos, transcripts, and uh, we'll have many more um podcast as well there too and if you want to pick up some of our books you can pick them up at uh warrior uh, no wake up warrior gear.com and as well as become a king.com if you want to learn more about our programs here at warrior any final words man no thank you very much for having me it's been a blast uh this conversation was spectacular 
Awesome. So for those of you that have um, resonated with this message, and if this message is something for you, uh, this, this one thing that you can apply in your life based on this conversation, awesome. And if you feel that this could also benefit another man, and in this case, another woman, just go ahead and forward this conversation to them. And hopefully from there, they can make extract, they can extract that one thing for them and make some changes. Gentlemen, have yourself a fantastic week. John, thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. Take care of yourself and each other.